Um, so I'm Jay Garfield, and I'd like to welcome everybody on behalf of the South Asia Concentration, the South Asia Program. I keep, I forgot to remember to say that. <laughs> South Asia Program at Smith College, and to thank the South Asia Program corporately and the Smith College Lecture Committee for sponsoring this event. Without the generosity of donors, nothing happens. So thank you very much, Lecture Committee. I'd like to begin um, to introduce our speaker tonight with a somewhat personal note. Um, as many of you know, from about a decade, um, my colleague Nalini Bouchon and I were working on this project on the history of philosophy um, during the period of British occupation in India. And it was a project that we began really not knowing anything at all. And in order to accomplish whatever we did accomplish, we needed an enormous amount of assistance from people who knew stuff. Um, scholarship requires the generosity of colleagues, in other words. Um, and we were steered to Professor Rosinka Chowdhury early on, partly because we had read her fabulous essay on Toru Dutt, a um, great Bengali um, poet and translator, of that period, and we realized this is somebody who is thinking hard about intellectual activity in India during the period um, that we're thinking about, and partly because other friends said, talk to Rosinka Chowdhury because she's really smart and you need to hear what she has to say. Um, so following advice and, and um, our reading of that piece, we turned up in Calcutta, and Professor Chowdhury had no particular reason to talk to us. Um, we were and still are nobody, and we didn't know anything. But with enormous generosity, um, she guided us on our research and our project, and, and our work goes a great deal um, to her um, collegiality and generosity. And so I first just want to call her out as one of the more generous um, intellectual colleagues that I have in the world, which is a wonderful thing. Thank you for that. Um, Professor Chowdhury, is the first Mellon Professor of Global South at Oxford University um, and is uh, Director of the Center for uh, Studies in Social Sciences in Calcutta. She has an enormous intellectual range um, covering a wide um, array of topics and approaches to thinking about literature in India, um, largely during the British um, occupation period, but also after independence. Besides the terrific work on Troy Dutt that I mentioned, um, she's written a terrific book, Gentlemen Poets in Colonial Bengal, Nationalism in the Orientalist Project, um, a fun piece, Freedom and Beefsteaks, about uh, the British and Bengali interactions in, in colonial India, um, the literary thing, history and poetry, the making of modern literature. She edited a terrific collection of De Rosio's poetry, another wonderful collection of um, Tagore's letters, um, and she's now working on uh, collecting and editing, and I guess translating Buddha Davis um, poetry, and is uh, working on a big project called Young Bengal and the Empire of the Middle Classes. Much of Professor Chaudhry's work explores the ways in which literature and um, a cosmopolitan sensibility um, among um, the, uh, the intellectuals of Bengal contributed to the development of the India that we know now. And looking at the role of the, of the terrific agency of Bengali and other Indian writers and intellectuals, politicians, poets, um, in the construction of the India we know now. And with all of that, I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Chaudhry, who's going to talk about Whose world? Reflections on world literature from the other side of the world. I'm not sure which is the other side. <laughs> they all seem other. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to start, of course, uh, perhaps obviously, but most sincerely, um, by thanking Jay and Nalini. Um, without whom uh, this talk wouldn't have been possible, this trip w to the US wouldn't have been possible. Um, I'm really grateful also um, to them for opening my eyes to the, 
the the field that they work in. Uh, Jay said a, said a lot about uh, you know uh, my own work uh, and my own prior preoccupations. But I was just sitting in Jay's office uh, 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 a little while ago and looking at, at some of the recent books that have come out and saying saying to him really that what the the two of them are doing is that they're bringing um, of of a field of Indian philosophy uh, philosophers in the 19th and 20th centuries who who are actually completely unknown not just to Indians at large but even to Indians like myself who are nominally at least educated <laughs> and should know more about about the sort of figures that they're 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 bringing to us so in a sense really they're they're returning our heritage um, uh, to us in a way that 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 must be very rewarding for them. I mean, apart from uh, uh, anything anything else. So, thank you for the work uh, you're doing and 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 uh, for the implications that that will have eventually, and I'm sure already does, but 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 will definitely have on um, succeeding generations. So 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 thank you for uh, having me, and thank you. Um, uh, for for the sort of work that you're you're doing as well, I'll quickly preface my I'm a very old-fashioned sort of presenter in that I simply read. I'm not going to show you images. Uh, if you you're free to fall asleep if you want, <laughs> because this is a wonderful thing about powerpoints and images, isn't it? That it keeps you all awake. But um, I shall try and do that with uh, my words alone. Um, I should say, though, quickly, that this um, uh, has come out of uh, the year I spent in Oxford as Mellon Professor, 2017-18, so quite recently, really. Um, in that, so because I belong to the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, I've been doing a lot of historical work, sort of, you know. Um, uh, I work at the intersection of literature and history, and I was just saying to Jay that the current work I'm doing, the Young Bengal work, is really more what I call pure history, and it makes me uncomfortable <laughs> and a little nervous. Um, but um, this one year that I was at Oxford, because I was with the, with the English department there, thankfully there being no Department of Cultural Studies in Oxford yet, um, I was forced to go back to my own discipline, which I very much enjoyed doing, and to go back to, uh, to it in, uh, through somebody whose work um, I know in dribs and drabs, uh, Rabin Rabindranath Tagore. But um, the substance of what you are to hear today was first formulated as, a, as the keynote lecture for the Mellon Professorship, where I basically <coughs> ref reflect on, so the, the essay, uh, the, the paper today is divided into two bits. The first bit will approach the field of world literary studies from my perspective as an academic located in Calcutta reacting to Emily Apter. <laughs> And the second part of the essay will read uh, Rabindranath Tagore's Bisho Shahitto or World Literature um, uh, rather differently than it has been read so far, I think. So with that, uh, I will read. Um, there's, a, there's an epigraph here um, from Blake that you all know, to see a world in a grain of sand. And I only mention it because it's, it, it may sort of help you to uh, uh, sort of see where, uh, what I'm getting at in the Tagore um, essay, Bisho Shait. So, about four years ago, at a seminar organized by an Ivy League American university at our premises at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta, I had received a brief reply to a question that I'd asked from, a young, from the young American moderator of the panel facing us that ended with some advice. Read Emily Apter. My question had more or less been ignored, but I will come to that later. I was irate enough with the response to then reread Apter's Against World Literature more carefully than I had before. As the sessions continued, it soon became abundantly clear that although the concept note for the seminar had highlighted the fact that, and I quote from the concept note, Calcutta presents a specific opportunity to draw a range of local scholarship and circumstances into the discussion, the local audience in the room, I felt at least, was simply meant to listen to, not comment on or interrupt the discussion. Rereading Emily Apter, I found that I had a similar complaint against her book. 
Although Apter's previous book, The Translation Zone, is recommended on the back cover of this one for being very unusual because of, quote, the impressive breadth and range of Apter's reading in literatures across the globe, I found very little of the world or indeed of literature in this one. Instead, it does beautifully what almost every other book on world literature feels it incumbent upon itself to do. It summarizes the field and makes a conceptual intervention. An important one, no doubt. That is not a criticism. And certainly nobody should admit to doing what I did. That is, search the book for literature or theory from India while making notes of disagreement or agreement on the margins with a pencil. Geographically speaking, although there were references to Asian modernisms, specifically to the Chinese, in the chapter on the problem of Eurochronology and periodicity, which noted that, quote, in Western literary criticism, even when the purview is world literature, Occidental genre categories invariably function as program settings. She does say that. The only Indian language words in the book, however, that I found were Vishya Shahitu, which she interestingly renders as literatures of the world rather than world literature without explaining why, Rashtriya Shahitu, national literature, and Rashtra or nation state. Hindi stroke Sanskrit stroke Bengali actually because Hindi and Sanskrit, Sanskrit is a sort of root language and uh, the same word can make sense in Gujarati, Hindi, Bengali. Uh, so, I have just said Hindi Sanskrit. Hindi Sanskrit words that are included in the chapter Keywords 5, Mond, in the, con in the context of another theorist's discussion of these concepts in an essay. The chapter discusses the pros and cons of the World Literature in French project of 2007, positioning the French debate as one developed in response to the widely validated post-colonially inflected model of Anglophone world literature, a field she is presumably placing herself both within and against. Nevertheless, it seemed to me that being against world literature, the title of her book, um, where did I, I've lost it, uh, yeah, against world literature did not mean a departure from the format of the polemic in almost all discussions on world literature, whether for or against. In that, her book embodies the Scythian dictum we all remember, that there may be a real orient out there somewhere with real people and real books in it but that Orientalism was not concerned with it, situated as it was within the Foucauldian understanding of discourse. Apter's book too transforms the real world into a discursive world with a capital W, or rather substitutes the one for the other. And it follows that, like many books on post-colonial theory that preceded it, theorists and their interventions predominate. Thus, there are also some references in the book to Indian theorists located at prestigious Western universities, but almost no references to Indian literatures. I do not, however, want to resurrect the old theory versus criticism debate here. As Eagleton famously argued in Introduction to Literary Theory, quoting J.M. Keynes, those economists who dislike theory or claim to get along better without it were simply in the grip of an older theory. That is also true, of course, of literary students and critics. The subtitle of Apter's book, Against World Literature on the Politics of Untranslatability, was possibly what was being gestured at in the moderator's response asking me to read Emily Apter, since her central thesis was, quote, the importance of non-translation, mistranslation, incomparability, and untranslatability, and to Activate untranslatability as a theoretical fulcrum of comparative literature with bearing on approaches to world literatures, literary world systems, and literary history, among other things. The book, refreshingly for me, did not disown its politics. It claimed, quote, a politics of literature critical of global literary management within corporate education. One reason why literary studies quote, falls short as anti-capitalist critique is because it insufficiently questions what it means to have a literature. Literary communities, she says, are gated. According to Western law in international statute, authors have texts, publishers have a universal right to translate, brackets, as long as they pay, and nations own literary patrimony as cultural inheritance, unquote. Here, translation seen as authorized plagiarism, belongs fully, she says, to no one. It is seen as 
a model of de-owned literature that stands against the swell of corporate privatization in the arts. So, a translational author shorn of a singular signature is the natural complement in my view, she says, to world literature, capital W, capital L, understood as an experiment in, in national sublation that signs itself as collective terrestrial property." Unquote. This principle stand, I thought it was a principle stand, this principle stand of uneasiness in the face of what she trenchantly calls the entrepreneurial bulimic drive to anthologize and curricularize the world's cultural resources, I love that phrase, is critical of studies of broad ambition like the Rutledge Companion to World Literature 2012, which she says falls, fall prey inevitably to the tendency to zoom over the speed bumps of untranslatability. And so far so good, I am in complete agreement. Untranslatability is a counter, she says, to the expansionism and gargantuan scale of world literary endeavors. It is also a move against the conditions of property value and economic privatization underwriting contemporary literary world systems. Yet, despite a careful delineation by Apter of her stand against world literature, where W and L are always in capital letters and within inverted commas, which she sees as grounded in market-driven notions of readability and universal appeal, and despite her thesis against this, proposing instead a plurality of world literatures, and here the W and the L are in small caps, oriented around philosophical concepts and geopolitical pressure points, she says, one finds, or rather I find at least, nevertheless, that against world literature is still structured around the same European philosophical concepts and the same geopolitical pressure points as the rest most talked of books in the field. Apter pits a world literature in small caps against one in capital letters and states she is against what she calls a flaccid globalism. She is against the grouping of non-European literatures under monolithic rubrics such as Islam or Asia. See, I find that term non-European itself problematic. There is Europe and there is a non-Europe which somehow doesn't reference America. Uh, America is always somehow not non-Europe. Um, yet, the authors she uses to make her case remain Pynchon, DeLillo, or at most Tolstoy, the theorists Wittgenstein and Derrida. I am not making a case here that she should have used Premchand or the one perennial favorite in world literature discussions, Tagore, instead. Following Derrida, one should know by now that overturning the binary is hardly a useful solution if anyone were ever brave enough to attempt this, however nice it would still be if someone tried. My argument pertains rather to the category of the world, as it is understood both commonly and theoretically in such a discussion. Where or what is it? Similar questions have been raised already by Amir Mufti, where in the world is world literature, and Feng Chia, what is a world? I have a discussion of both these authors' conceptualizations of the world in the <coughs> larger paper, um, which I won't go into here in the interests of time. Suffice to say that, as you know, I'm sure, Mufti is primarily concerned with the question of Orientalism, placing Said's book as the very condition of possibility uh, for the development of the field of world literature. But it is Europe for Mufti, which is the ground on which the argument of his chapter asking where in the world world literature is, is staged. Nevertheless, Mufti does bring in more of the world into his book than most other theorists combined, covering Calcutta Orientalism and a range of literary work, both Anglophone and in the Indian languages, in the book. Feng Chia, on the other hand, asks what exactly is the world in recent attempts to rethink world literature in the North Atlantic Academy in his book titled What is a World 2016, discussing the temporal dimension that is integral to the understanding of wealth literature, pointing out that Auerbach had stressed the point that the humanism of Goethe's concept is historicist, he says. It is related to the past and to the future, to world history. The universal history of the human spirit is facilitated, he says, by, quote, a vision of the achievements of the human species organized into a narrative of universal progress, 
<laughs> and we should remember this line when we come finally in the end to a discussion of uh, Tagore's Bishu Shahitu. I began with the seminar moderator who suggested I read Emily Apter for a reason. Apter's book is a handy tool around which to arrange a discussion on world literature. Firstly, almost everybody studying world literature seems to have read it. And following from that, more importantly, it might then allow us to ask the question that forms the title of this paper. Whose world are we talking about when we talk world literature? Apter herself notes that there have been few interventions that questions what a world might be. More emphasis on how, she says, philosophy has defined monde would co contribute theoretical substance, she says, to the paradigm of literature monde and nuance debates around world literatures in every language, she says. Adding in a footnote that she proposes this form a philological point of view that nourishes the consideration of words themselves as objects of analysis. I wondered that when she said nuance debates around world literatures in every language, what she meant by every language. Uh, I thought to myself, for instance, that there's no awareness of the robust debates on the issue as they happened in Bengali, for instance over here in this book, but also whose philosophy she was referring to when she spoke of simply how philosophy has defined Mond. My argument, however, is different here. What I am pointing to is that ironically, it is in fact the category called world that repeats itself so often in the current epidemic of commentary on world literature sweeping the humanities in the West that itself silently constitutes often continuity with the famil familiar hegemonic structures of academic thinking. Europe may already have been provincialized by history itself. That's the Gadamer quote that Deepesh Chakraborty uses in provincializing Europe as an, as an epigraph. But the humanities classroom in the West, as well as in the post-colony, in our classrooms as well, are still heavily predicated on the centrality of Euro-American theory to discussions on world literature. Post-colonial studies at least spoke of difference. World literature theorists speak of the world, but whose world? In an article in the New York Times in 2008, art the art critic Holland Cotter had an insight he wanted to share with the Western world or at least a middle-class American readership, the kind who read the New York Times. Reviewing a show called Rhythms of India, the Art of Nandalal Bush, 1882-1966, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, he wrote of how modernity is conceived of as having happened exclusively in the West and then distributed like food aid to the rest. I'm quoting Cotter. Along with detailed information about one artist's life and times, the show delivers a significant piece of news, or what is still probably news to many people, that modernism wasn't a purely Western product sent out like so many care packages to a hungry and waiting world. It was a phenomenon that unfolded everywhere in different forms at different speeds for different reasons under different pressures, but always under pressure. As cool and above it all as modern may sound, it was a response to emergency. In India, the emergency was a bruising colonialism that had become as intolerable to artists as to everyone else." Unquote. So at the end of his retrospection on the modern art of Nandulal Bush and reflecting on the bedrock of modern Indian culture from which it sprang. So if you are interested later, if you sort of Google Nandulal Bush, you'll find that this is the artist also who's illustrated the Indian constitution, for instance. So very important um, uh, artist of the uh, early 20th century um, uh, in India. So at the end of his retrospection on the modern art of Nandulal Bosch and reflecting on the bedrock of modern Indian culture from which it sprang, Cotter concludes, quote, that every museum of modern art in the United States and Europe should be required in the spirit of truth in advertising to change its name to Museum of Western Modernism until it has earned the right to do otherwise, unquote. The analogy is useful in more ways than one. The museum here is like the shop floor where in the premises of the theoretical argument the maximum use of floor space is devoted to the anglophone or at most the anglo-french academy. Uh, 
Mufti's high profile book for instance could be imagined to be an elite shop floor endorsed as it is by Homi Bhabha, David Damrosh and Emily Apter on the back cover and published by Harvard University Press. Showcasing a discussion on theories of world literature that is still firmly dominated by currents prevalent in the Anglophone Academy. When I use the image of the shop floor, the analogy I have in mind is the one Amit Choudhury uses in his essay Notes on the Novel After Globalization in Clearing a Space, where he reflects on how, I am quoting, it is for instance, and this essay was written in the late 90s because that was the time you still had HMV stores on, on the main street. But it, it is, for instance, always a task to enter a mainstream music and DVD store and search for the corner that displays world cinema. Similarly, world music, which is largely a post-globalization construct comprising a mishmash of classical, folk and popular traditions from non-Anglophone countries. In this case, the global anthropologizes the world makes it remote, ornamental, tribal." Unquote. So this anthropologizing of the literary wares of the world by the global marketplace works in the sphere of world literature studies as well, it seemed to me. Squeezing the rest of the world, metaphorically speaking, into small stalls selling representative samples. A direct consequence of neoliberal globalization and the attendant flattening out by the markets of differences and networks, this functioning of world literature studies within the Western Hemisphere remains unaddressed by theorists such as Muf Mufti or Apter, who nonetheless lay claim to a politics of literature critical of global literary management within corporate education. As Cotter's opinion above shows, the arena of discussions on world literature today could also be compared to a Western museum. There are smaller displays from other parts of the world, whether theoretical or material, categorized or used and labeled almost as neatly as museum displays. But the curation, conceptualization and location of the matter of the exhibition or the academic book on world literature at any particular time remains emphatically an in-house affair, where in-house equals world. Like the many museums of modern art, a name that claims a certain univers universality located in New York or London, the tour one undertakes upon entering any of these discussions on world literature is curated locally, however inappropriate a term like local might seem when applied to New York or London, and addressed primarily to local audiences. After all, New York is where the museum and its discourse are located, just as Apter's ac academic location is. And therefore, they need make no claim to be representational. As Apter says in her introduction, her book does not aim to be a comprehensive census taking of the field of world literature with pretenses to regional coverage and equitable language distribution. There are few close encounters with individual texts and the texts that are analyzed have been selected because they illuminate a problem and not because they are representative texts of world literatures. Now, I am basically in sympathy with this here. We can discuss this later, but I am not arguing either for a sort of representative sample of all the literatures of the world in every book to be written on, on world literature. It, it's really firstly impossible to do that and secondly very boring. Uh, that's what you get when the Indian government uh, arm of, um, uh, of the literary, the Sahitya Academy brings out sort of you know anthologies of, of publications. You just get a tome with you know li literature from the east of India, the west of India, the north of India, all very representational and that just really actually doesn't do the job. So that's not what I'm arguing for her, for her, I mean here either. So I'm basically in sympathy with quite a lot that Apter is doing. Um, anyway, so uh, rather she says against world literature lists a number of what she calls loosely affiliated topoi, one worldedness, literary world systems, terrestrial humanism, checkpoints, theologies of translation, the translational interdiction, pedagogy, authorial de-ownership, possess possessive collectivism. That provide many different ways, she says, of looking at how untranslatability plays out in literary studies. 
I am in essential agreement with her use of Badiou's notion of hypertranslation in conjugation with Kessor's ultimate goal of consequential relativism. So this is sort of, sorry, I'm compressing a lot from uh, a larger discussion. Um, uh, but she, she points out in the book that uh, Badiou, as she points out, quoting Kenneth Reinhardt, quote, sublimates Plato's text in Lacan's sense of sublimation as the elevation of an object to the status of a thing, which is precisely to defamiliarize it, to bring out its strangeness, so that one does not in any way privilege the aura of the original. The reason I sort of just quote this uh, in this compressed space because this elevation of an object to the status of a thing with a capital T, the bringing out of its strangeness is something we'll come to later to at the end of the paper in Tagore and in Barth. So, the second half of the paper, Rabindranath Tagore's Alternative World Literature. The question I had asked the panel at the CCCC conference was predicated on the notion of translation. Not literally in the context of textual translation, but more to do with the translation of self at the moment of contact with the other. Not wanting to ask the usual question of the local and the global, I was fundamentally concerned with the moment of contact as the local person interacted with the global ship, commodity, system or person in the era of colonization. So the conference had been titled Radiating Globality, just uh, you know, uh, uh, to give you the context. So when I used the word translation, I thought I had made it clear that I wasn't talking just of translations of literature, sort of not just texts, but of the manner in which, say, objects are translated and used as they travel, or places are translated under the pressure of globality. The line I had in mind was that spoken to bottom on his becoming an ass, thou art translated. Perhaps I should have used transformation instead. Perhaps the moderator in his response was trying to respond to the tendency these days to use translation as too general a concept metaphor. I will attempt here substantially to elaborate on this notion of translation as transformation using Rabindranath Tagore's essay, Bishya Shahitya or World Literature. Here I hope to show how this could be read as a foundational text that argues for an idea of world literature that is quite unique, apart from being a reading that also, I think, overturns Goethe's concept of wealth literature and actually turns it on its head. This essay by Tagore, Bisho Shaito, is collected by David Damrosh in the first section to World Literature in Theory, titled Origins, as well as cited and discussed in his introduction to that book. I thought Damrosh doesn't quite know what to do with the Tagore essay at hand. While he devotes many delighted paragraphs to Goethe's seminal reflections on wealth literature in his conversations with Johann Peter Eckermann in the late 1820s in this introduction, and, and his discussion of the Goethe-Eckermann conversations is actually much more detailed and exhaustive in his book, What is World Literature, where his commentary on this runs into many pages. Of Tagore here, however, in the context of his inclusion in his anthology, he only has a single paragraph or so, and I'll quote the paragraph. He says, ideas of world literature spread far beyond Europe in the early decades of the 20th century. Origins, the section titled Origins, concludes with two path-breaking statements on world literature from two very different locations. In his 1907 essay on Bisha Shahito or world literature, Rabindranath Tagore speaks of the universal values that world literature can embody, an argument that served a strategic local purpose of its own, offering a counter to England's strategy of ruling its colonial possessions in India by dividing and conquering." Unquote. To start with, the sentence construction of the first line there, ideas shown spreading out from Europe to far beyond it, gestures incipiently towards the first in the West and then in the rest model, which has surely, once we actually begin to investigate the growth and interaction of literatures, only a limited use. Pathbreaking Rabindranath's essay certainly was, but Dembrush doesn't seem to read it for what it actually says. Instead, he touches two familiar bases. One, Tagore speaks of the universal values that world literature can embody. And two, Tagore's argument is a counter to England's strategy of divide and rule. I'm not very sure why. 
He concludes his brief comments on the essay with, again I quote, Tagore's universalism had an outward as well as an inward looking use. A few years after delivering his lecture, Tagore undertook the step of translating his book length poem Gitanjali into English, a self translation that led to his becoming the first Asian winner of the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Literature in 1913. Unquote. As much as the poet, I mean Rabindranath Tagore, might have abhorred the idea of these translations from four scattered and slim volumes of his Bengali poetry, not one book length poem, having what Damrosh calls an outward use, how this was an outcome of what Damrosh calls his universalism is even more mysterious if one reads Rabindranath's essay. Damrosh's mention of Tagore's Nobel Prize in Literature in 1913 references the inevitable worldwide circulation of the prize winning text, thus fitting into Damrosh's theoretical paradigm of what makes world literature. But Robindranath himself might not have valorized the outward uses of poetry in quite the same way. He wrote repeatedly, as we know, of the history of chance and misdirection and the role of the unconscious, both in the form these translations took as well as in their physical journey to fame. You know, of course, he lost the notebooks with the <laughs> translations on the London Underground. Though one must be wary, of course, of Tagore's of his own constructions regarding his creativity, which were hardly, as was once claimed for the British Empire, built entirely by accident. Rabindranath's essay on world literature is important, it seems to me, rather, because it advocates a method of doing world literature that potentially frees us from the conundrums besetting the methods that we've been discussing so far remarkable for the manner in which it turns the notion of world literature on its head, as I hope to explain. The idea of the world that he arrives at in this essay, in complete contrast to Goethe's, is a notion of the world turned upside down to mean something entirely other in relation to the self. Bishya Shahito, or World Literature, the essay, was presented at the National Council of Education, which later became Jadapur University, in Calcutta on 9th February 1907, when Rabindranath Tagore was 46 years old and an established poet in the Bengali literary sphere, although still unknown to the world. So he hasn't received the Nobel Prize yet. It begins by saying that three things connect us to the world. First, the intellect, which is arrogant with the power of knowledge. Second, self-interest imbued with use value. And third, anundo or joy, where we truly experience ourself. It is important to note the untranslatability of the word anundo here. Joy is too much on the surface to capture the spiritual resonances of anundo, but it will have to su suffice because pleasure or happiness uh, are too social in their connotations. Um, you can't use those for uh, anundo. Again and again in songs and in poems and in his criticism, Rabindranath has reiterated the importance of Anundo. Here he asks, what is this thing I call the connection with Anundo? And he answers, it is when we know the other as ourself and know ourself as the other. Another slightly Shellian translation exists, it is nothing but knowing others as our own and ourselves as other. These are the un unacknowledged words, unacknowledged by Tagore himself. These are the unacknowledged words of Chundidash, the medieval Bengali poet whose song, Peter, uh, whose song Peter McDonald has quoted in Artifacts of Writing with reference to Tagore's intercultural ideals as, e as exemplified in his university, Bisho Bharati, no less than in Bisho Shahito. The lines of the song, I have made others my own people and my own people others, are paraphrased by Rabindranath without acknowledging Chundidash, something he does again later in Bishashaito when he says, in this way, in order to express itself, the heart is constantly at pains to find the world in ourself and ourself in the world. We come at the end of the numerous examples and metaphors furnished by Tagore to elaborate upon his understanding of what, 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 what literature is and what literature does to his claim that literature needs to exist in a domain without self-interest. Parallel to the world of necessity, man creates a world of literature, which is superfluous, chara. The notion of excess is returned to. He points out that beauty is extravagance, 
It is excessive and wasteful expenditure. Behisha bhi baje khoroch. It exceeds need. It flowers without use and flows without purpose. Nature, Tagore's analogy here for writing, is large because it is full of the unnecessary. What is expressed in literature, he asks, and answers directly. We find man's excess, prachurju, his wealth, oishodju, that which overflows all his need. It has that which does not finish within the boundaries of his world. This preoccupation with the superfluous goes back at least to 1894 to Rabindranath's essay on children's nursery rhymes, discussed again by Amit Chaudhary in Clearing a Space, where two words such as onaboshuk or useless, um, or that which is not necessary, are used repeatedly and the celebration of the arbitrary and the unfinished, the superfluous and the purposeless in that essay, Chaudhary says, refer to, quote, a sort of space that Tagore is talking about, a reconfiguration of emptiness or a crack, a gap in the everyday realm of valuation. Now, Bishu Shahito, I think, is remarkable, not just for the vision it holds of world literature, but because of the potential that vision holds in relation to reading world literature today. The preoccupations inherent in the essay are emblematic of Rabindranath's thinking, creating a thread with earlier and later works that helps us to understand his earth as it expressed his own thinking. One such continuity that may be traced between his thoughts here and those to be found expressed in the last essay he wrote or dictated, Shahitya Oitihashikota, or Historicality in Literature, a few months before he died from his deathbed in 1941, is that of a quotation he uses from the sage Yagnavalkya that occurs in both essays. About 34 years, years separate the two essays, but the line from the Vedanta still speaks to him at the end of his life as it had here in relation to world literature. I will not read the Sanskrit uh, uh, sloka. Ranajit Guho's discussion of these lines as they occur in historicality in literature, in history at the limits of world history, notes that these lines recur in six articles by Rabindranath in ways that are all at variance with each other. So it's obviously a line that means a great deal to him. The kernel of Rabindranath's thought in Bisho Shahito is contained in a few paragraphs towards the end of the essay, in the final couple of pages, where he arrives at the crux of the matter. Now he says, and it's very interesting if you try to read this, so I must tell you this because when I was working on the essay, I found that when I, when I read the essay in the English language, I, I just found myself unable to make a great deal of sense of it. Because actually the entire length of the essay, he j and in the way that Tagore often does, he just waffles, it seems to me. He just goes on and on and on with metaphor after metaphor after metaphor, and you're just wondering, what exactly is, you know, what is he getting at? So, I actually had to uh, write to my librarian uh, at the center in Calcutta and tell her to please, for God's sake, PDF the, the, the Bengali version of the essay to me because I just wasn't, you know, be, being able to wade through all the, you know, um, uh, all the stuff in English. And it was only after receiving the Bengali essay that I actually managed to read it and see that he's coming actually at the end to a very, very interesting, and it's all done very briefly in a flash towards the, right towards the end, almost in a page and a half, where he's actually formulating what he means um, by um, world literature. So, so the kernel of, the thought, of his thought here is contained in a few paragraphs towards the end of the essay, in the final couple of pages, where he arrives at the crux of the matter. Now, he says, after going on for God knows how many pages, now it is time to come to the point, which is, if we reduce literature to time, place, thing, desh, kal, patro, we do not properly comprehend it. The writer, apparently, must express the sorrow of all mankind for his writing to assume the status of literature. I should say that this is the only universalist sentiment that Damrosh had flagged as central, which I could find in the entire essay. Once more, we encounter an extended metaphor. Literature is a temple always under construction, but without a plan. He has been called here, he says, to the National Council of Education to talk about what in English is called comparative literature, but which he shall call in Bengali, Bisho Shahitto. So he's coining a phrase here. Literally, Bisho Shahitto, world literature. 
Literature, Rabindranath continues, is not mere information. Akbar's rule, Gujarat's history, Elizabeth's character, these are merely the devices one may use. Literature is when the writer, quote, tries to show us the everyday man in his everyday efforts and desires, unquote. Finally, we come to what world literature is. It is, he says, when man expresses his anundo through literature and when man's self <coughs> wants to display that eternal self in varied expressions, that is the only thing worth looking for in world literature. And again, we must not interpret it as a constructed composition. It is a world. Iha ke kritim rachana bolia jani le hoi bena, iha ekti jagot. World literature then is not the sum of literatures in the world. Rather, literature is a world. So here finally we have it, world literature turned on its head. It is not literature in and of the world. It is a world, iha ekti jagot. It is to be found within the self that expresses itself. Therefore, it is within the self and not in the world. Further, it is a world always under construction, always unfinished, always striving for completion. Like Rabindranath suggests, the mandala of the sun, the trembling light surrounding the part fluid, part solid inner sun, literature is, he says, an intangible emanation made of words around man, surrounding him, spreading around him and connecting with him. The second world all around the world of man, that is literature. This is contrary to Goethe's Welt literature, Welt literature in German. A term, Damrosch says, quote, he popularized while reading a Chinese novel in a week when he was also reading Persian and Serbian poetry, all in French or German translations, together with poems by Pierre Jean de Beranger in the original. Goethe's world literature is established in the context of his voracious reading in a surprisingly wide range of foreign literatures, we can see. Through Goethe's conversations with Eckermann, Damrosch says, we gain a nuanced picture of his manifold encounters with foreign texts. Such a contextualization places Goethe's notion of world literature firmly in the world and of it, transcending boundaries and nations, encountering foreign texts, but circulating, a favorite word with, uh, uh, of Damrosch's, within the world. world Literature is the blue chip moniker, Apter says, benefiting from, from its pedigreed association with Goethean Welt literature. But what prevents it from associating instead with Rabindranath's path breaking formulation? Perhaps Tagore isn't blue chip enough. Rabindranath, in complete contradistinction to Goethe, crucially ends his essay by reminding his audience that world literature is not an addition of parts. In conclusion, he says, I quote, I only wanted to say that just as the world is not my field and your field and someone else's field, so too literature is not my writing, your writing and someone else's writing. That is a very provincial way of knowing the world. Ordinarily, we view literature in this provincial way. He does not add here that this provincialism emanates from Europe. Although he has said that, although he has said that in other contexts, and here I want you to remind you of what uh, Feng Chia said in the context of world literature, that it is a very historicist conception uh, of world literature. Uh, but Tagore, of course, we know has said that in other contexts. His complaints against Western civilization are, are legendary. Um, what he would ask for rather is to free ourselves of this provincialism and aim to see the world of man, Bisho Manub, in world literature, Bisho Shahitto. But how? It would involve, Tagore suggests, discovering an accumulation, a convergence or coming together, Shomogruta is the Bengali word, in the work of each writer and then perceiving in that coming together a relational a relationality, shambandhu, to do with all the expressions of man. That is the problem and delight of confronting literature as a world rather than of it. This overturning of how we do literature in the world, that is the problem and delight of confronting literature as a world rather than of it, 
is the fundamental contribution made by Rabindranath to the debate on world literature, I think. What I want to emphasize here is this notion of world literature being, uh, is that this notion of world literature being irreducible to time, place, thing or Desh Kalpatro, which is exactly what is conventionally not done in studies of world literature today as they inevitably, it, that's what is, is sort of missing because as they, what they inevitably do do is they, they map worlds or track, as Damrosh says, devices, themes, tropes or genres and systems in an attempt to find a universal conceptual method of reading which is not overly concerned with what is within the text itself or the world, a world created within the text. For such readings as Damrosh's, it is Goethe's world literature that is established as the core methodological text, formulated as it was in the context of his voracious reading in a surprisingly wide range of foreign literatures. This is world literature understood as time, place, thing. But if we recall, Rabindranath said, Rabindranath said let's not do literature in uh, with this understanding of it as time, place, thing. Uh, the paradoxical approach that Rabindranath gives us in his essay is the claim that world literature is not an addition of parts. It is not an addition of, say, French, Serbian, Persian, German and other national literatures. Do not think for a moment that I will be the one to show you the way in this world literature we will all have to carve out our own paths according to our individual abilities," Rabindranath said in his, con in his concluding paragraph of the essay. These notions of world literature or the literatures of the world understood as the self in relation to the other, as an emanation, as a site permanently under construction, as a world are anti-historicist, predicated upon an understanding privileging fragmentation rather than the whole the resistance of the untranslatable rather than the market circulation of translatability, of the epiphany of the moment rather than what Hegel called the prose of the world. In conclusion, I could go back to how Rabindranath begins the essay by saying that three things connect us to the world. Rabindranath, remember, that's what I began the uh, discussion of his essay with. He said, three things connect us to the world. The connection of intellect, which is arrogant with the power of knowledge. The connection of self-interest, imbued with use value. And the third, anundo, where we truly experience ourself. And sh I c what I could do is, I could take you back to the beginning of that essay and show you how those three attitudes of mind are described in the Bhagavad Gita in lines 20 to 22 of book 18. Yuan Maskaro's old introduction to the Upanishads quotes these lines from the Gita that sound strikingly similar to Rabindranath's formulation. When one sees eternity in things that pass away and infinity in finite things, then one has pure knowledge. But if one merely sees the diversity of things with their divisions and limitations, then one has impure knowledge. And if one selfishly sees a thing as if it were everything, independent of the one and the many, then one is in the darkness of ignorance. The relation between the whole and the particular in the first line and the fortuitous echo in the second line of the Tagorean sense of the futility of seeing merely the diversity of things in world literature are at once evident. As too is Tagore's aversion to the pedantic in the third as he expressed it in his final essay, Shahitya Oitihashikota. But rather than stay too long with the immemorial Upanishads, like the proverbial Bengali villager who calmly observed that it had all been done before in the Vedas. I mean, I don't want to read Rabindranath and say to you, look, it was all already there in the Upanishads. <laughs> I would like to turn instead to Barth, who in writing Degree Zero had made a similar argument to Tagore's when speaking of the establishment of literature in the French context, and he too insists on using literature with a capital L there. He wrote of the manner in which history underlines the m fortunes of modes of writing. After the demise of the classical and romantic periods came the moment of the birth of literature. He says, as soon as the writer ceased to be a witness to the universal, to become the incarnation of a tragic awareness around 1850, his first gesture was to choose the commitment of his form, either by adopting or rejecting the writing of his past. Classical writing therefore disintegrated and the whole of literature from Flaubert to the present day became the problematics of language. This was precisely the time when literature, the word having come into being shortly before, was finally established as an object. 
The problematics of language in modern poetry for Bath is about reducing discourse to words as static things, where the primacy of the word is absolute. Modern poetry, he says, is a poetry of the object. But the unexpected object here is each poetic word. This hunger of the word, common to the whole of modern poetry, makes poetic speech terrible and inhuman, full of gaps and full of lights, filled with absences and without stability of intention. The bursting upon us of the poetic word then institutes an absolute object, and here the object cannot have any resort to the content of the discourse. It is not about the subject matter because it turns its back on both history and social life. You see the parallels with what Tagore is saying in his essay. Um, this account of a certain historic moment and a definitive turn with its rejection of the markers of history and social life is uncannily reminiscent of Rabindranath's definition of the poetic as are the reasons for which both thinkers abhor those categories which are to do with their rejection of narrative. Rabindranath spoke in Bisho Shahito against understanding literature as an artificial construct, Kritim Rochana. Narrative the way Bath reads, this, reads it is what world literature studies is currently in academic readings, I, I think. <laughs> Quote, the ideal instrument, this is Bath, the ideal instrument for every construction of a world. It is the unreal time of cosmogenies, myths, histories and novels. It presupposes a world which is constructed, elaborated, self-sufficient, reduced to significant lines and not one which has been sent sprawling before us for us to take or leave. Unquote. Speaking of the serial story of those long recitative, uh, the, the recitatives, the novel and history, Bath called them plain projections of a curved and organic world of which the serial story presents through its involved complications a degraded image. At a particular historical moment in the 19th century, the function of the narrator, the preterite and the third person, quote, exploded reality to a slim and pure logos without density, without volume, without spread and whose sole function is to unite as rapidly as possible a cause and an end. The order of narrative brings coherence and, st and the structure of relations to reality. Thanks to it, Bath points out, reality is neither mysterious nor absurd anymore. It is clear, he says, almost familiar, repeatedly gathered up and contained in the hands of a creator. Unquote. It might be too much to ask that like modern poetry, discussions of world literature too dissociate themselves from the markers of whatever we understand to be the world. Theorists of world literature by and large seem beholden to the rationale of the narrative, whose sole function is to unite as rapidly as possible a cause and an end. And in doing so, they subscribe also to a pedagogical imperative of connecting the world to history and thereby of imparting to it the second order appearance of a constructed artifact of the sort Rabindranath warns it should not be. It could also have been he who wrote these words that seem reminiscent of the status of world literature today, though it is Bath, I quote again. But just as in the present state of history, any political mode of writing can only uphold a police world, any intellectual mode of writing can only give rise to a para-literature which no longer dares to speak its name. Both are therefore in a complete blind alley. They can lead only to complicity or impotence, which means in either case to alienation." Unquote. An intellectual mode of writing that is a para-literature which no longer dares to speak its name. That could be a description of the manner in which world literature, it seems to me, is done in the academy today. Celebrating 20 years of interventions, Robert Young said recently that, uh, uh, said recently, while redefining and resituating the issues that originally defined post-colonial studies, that world literature has emerged, he says, as the triumph of literature's role to represent the other. That, it seems now to me, was the polemical charge of post-colonial studies, not of world literature studies, which shies away from any analysis of literature's role to represent the other and shirks the potential it has of exploring where the writer's world might be located. 
politically world literature studies seems to have taken, like much of the world's politics, several steps backward from some of the gains made by its predecessor, with which it shares its often sociological and theoretical orientation, as well as its obsession with the minutiae of what it itself is constituted of and done not a great deal in overhauling the limitations and curtailments its predecessor had put in place in relation to the literary. Doing world literature today is not synonymous anymore with an interest in the literatures of the world or in the relation of the self and the other or in the particular and the whole. In a context in which literature no longer matters, perhaps that is entirely appropriate. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for questions. And we're going to um, follow Australian rules. That is a hand for a question and finger for a follow up. And fingers will have questions. Yes. Um, when you said that, or I don't think it was maybe you were quoting someone, but when you read that, um, literature shouldn't be confined to time, place, and thing. Were those the three? Um, I'm trying to see if I understood that. So is that saying that we should try to take out the parts of a reading that are applicable to humans regardless of time and place? This phrase was used by uh, Tagore in, in the essay itself. And I think what he meant by it is, is so I have two uh, responses, to, responses to that. One is he explained it himself in the essay when he says, you know, li literature is not just about Elizabeth's reign or Akbar's rule or, you know, Gujarat. These are the three examples he uses. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing to me is I think what he means there is literature is not just content. So, so in a sense there, he seems to be paraphrasing Susan Sontag in Against Interpretation. Basically, he's saying you cannot reduce literature to what literature is simply about. I mean, literature is not simply the content. Uh, 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 it's not simply um, time, place, thing. So that's, that's, one, one, that's what, he, what he himself is saying. What I would also say is that, is that uh, now in 2018, we, when especially uh, students of literature, people like us who sort of, you know, uh, read literature for whatever reasons uh, that we do. Um, ever sort of ever since the post-structuralists and the post-colonialists and cultural studies, um, what we do now is, and I always find um, these lines very interesting when I, when I teach Sides Orientalism, how hard he's arguing against um, sort of, you know, and he, he uh, against the the, the, the detail and against looking at, you know, what's in the text and he's, and he's arguing and again and again, look at the exteriority uh, of it. But now what seems to have happened is we see only the exteriority of it rather than actually try and find what's in, uh, in it, in the literary itself. Um, so, so that's, that's just my, my spin on what Tagore, Tagore was saying. But Tagore is basically using the phrase, Desh uh, Kalpatro, time, place thing, to say that literature is not just content, just as he's saying literature is not just my field, plus just as the earth is not my, uh, by field actually what he means is, you know, uh, the farmer's um, uh, sort of field. So it's not just my farm and your farm and somebody else's farm. So similarly, so you can't sort of map the globe in that way. Uh, so similarly, literature is not simply your literature plus her literature plus the other person's literature, you have to actually look at something more than simply content, simply the that parcel of territory that comprises a national literature, say, for instance. Mm -hmm. So so that's why he uses that particular phrase. Please follow up on your own. Follow -up. Um, what do you mean by exteriority? So exteriority is simply, I simply mean it in the uh, ordinary sense of the sociological of, of you know, of coming to literature with, with, with an agenda, which, which 
I'm not, I, so I don't want to sound, so maybe, you know, uh, uh, sort of critiques like mine can come after the substantial gains that have already been achieved by, say, gender studies or post-colonial studies in bringing, in shattering the canon and bringing, you know, uh, uh, which is all, uh, which is all, which, which has been done and without which one couldn't now say what I am saying, which is that perhaps the baby has been thrown out with the bathwater in that what has happened to the literary itself or what has happened to literature itself uh, in the process. So you're saying in 2018 a lot of academics look more at the exteriority, meaning don't look at um, the context of when the first Are there happened? very many people looking well, at... I'm asking, is that what you were saying? And I'm asking you in oh, return, do yes. you think, do you, do you think you, I mean, are there very many uh, sort of well-known literary, sort of, you know, literary critics who are actually looking at the, 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 the texture of the literary and um, what makes the literary um, anymore? I don't read literary critics, so I'm not sure. Ah, but there you are. I wonder if this is an example of what you mean. Um, so I major in philosophy, so when we read like quite black and whitely, literally, when we read white philosophers, we don't really talk about we don't really talk about um, their background and where they lived and how long they lived where they lived and mm. if they traveled mm. and what their mm. struggles were. But in my African American philosophy course, we always go through a history lesson of every single philosopher mm. before mm. reading their text. So mm. I'm wondering if what you're saying mm. is um, that by not looking at literature as time, place, thing, we would pull out the logic. But that's how I think mm. of things in terms mm. of like mm. pulling out the logic mm. behind. Mm a book mm. like pulling out and you know when you said the word agenda I wonder if that could be replaced with like bringing in a certain moral or like story for, mm. to explain a certain logic of how mm. we should live I think a lot of people are doing that anyway without intending to mm -hmm. and so yeah I wonder if that's what you're getting at like how when we look at non-white philosophy we look at time place thing but not when we look at white philosophy. Because, because white philosophy is universal. Okay. Because it is, it is human philosophy. It's not it, like the Ho Holland Cotter quote. I mean, like me, your, your museums of modern art simply say museums of modern art. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't say, if you go into, as I did just a few days ago, if you go into the New York MoMA, uh, you, all you see is Western modern art. You don't see Nandulal Bosch or Biman Bihari Mukherjee, although a small Biman Bihari Mukherjee painting has been put into the Tate Modern Eye here next to Matisse. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> but yes, so maybe the world will change. But uh, yeah, that's, that's more or less. Yeah, yeah. This is, oh, okay, so uh, uh, I was thinking, could it be that this um, Western academia's um, intense focus on categorization of literature and it, it going under the, the label of world literature and then within that intense categorization of this is this, this mm -hmm. is this, um, be a legacy or holdover of imperialist sentiments of their obsession with categorization because if we can mm -hmm. separate if, if we can separate then there can be an implied difference mm -hmm. and by implied difference mm -hmm. an implied Less. It's an interesting thought. I mean, um, the 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 whole sort of enlightenment project w did happen at the same time as the colonization of the rest of the world, and and the manner in which uh, Europe, the European Enlightenment, was actually brought into existence by. Uh, you know, by colonization is not something that's, 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 uh, it has been dealt with, people have written about it, but not as centrally as, 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 as one would like. So, 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 uh, sure, yeah, um, you know, I, I think so. Um, simple answer, yes. <laughs> yeah. I too have read, uh, you know, the English uh, translations of essays of Tagore, where he keeps harping on this notion of uh, the self and mm. you know the creative mm. self, mm. Uh, the finding the self mm. and the other, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. 
But I, and, and he talks about excess everywhere mm. uh, as the desire mm. thing. Mm. And I wondered if he was in particular militating against the, the entire discourse of useful knowledge and not just utilitarianism oh, yes. mm. as a as a, a colonial philosophy, but the uh, but the bourgeois understanding, Bengali bourgeois, mm. and Indian bourgeois yes. understanding of yes. useful knowledge yes. as the prime, uh, the, in the, the first yes. category, the yes. intellectual achievement yes. that one should aspire to, yep. and as a condition of modernity. Yep. And is that is that part of his argument? Absolutely, absolutely. He argues it again and again, and not only yeah. argues it, it, it's it's actually also there in 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 the establishment of his university, Bishobharati. I mean, basically, Same he's si yeah he's yeah he's simply saying that that you your the manner in which you organize knowledge <coughs> is just not good enough, and I'm going to do it differently. And he just does it differently. He 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 has his own ideas of what learning is of how creativity should uh, uh, flourish so he sets up these schools of art of music of drama of literature and he conducts classes uh, under the trees when he can uh, when he, 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 he he tries to give it a body and a meaning in the most practical way that that, that he could have actually in that in that place itself in Shantri in, in Bishabharati and there exactly you see what he's railing against when he's when he's uh, and he got into very interesting arguments with um, sort of you know someone like Sir Jodunath Sharkar who was uh, you know uh, India's preeminent historian at the time who he asked to be on the board of governors and Jod there's a very interesting uh, sort of exchange of letters between them where Sharkar says I don't think what you're doing is actually imparting knowledge at all and I don't think that's uh, that's what a mod that's what a modern university should look like so no I'm not going to be on your board of governors so that's a very very interesting uh, sort of you know, um, That's brilliant, uh, uh, what you just now said because I was wondering because yes. he was swimming against the current, yes, in a very 1907. Yes, he's, he's really against everything, yes. absolutely, that, that yes, going on, yes, and and that there would have been such a, mm. a, a debate, mm. I think, is, is mm. absolutely wonderful, yeah. And that, I hope you there was. About it. I have, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I have, but I've brought in Adorno as well. Very, uh, it's very interesting very the connections you can draw, yeah. Thank you. That was really, really fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Great, thanks. Um, so, uh, I, you know, the mosaic, and you, tell me if I got this right, intellect, self-interest, and joy. Mm. Three, mm. Yes. Mm. What is your take on the constellation of these three? Because you, you read the Bengali. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking intellect, self-interest kind of go together, but joy is sort of it, it blasts into mm. the horizon and mm. says something very different. Mm. So what is your reading mm. of how, how, you know, Anundo and uh, mm. the other two, mm. how do you read mm. the three mm. together? Mm. And what kind of joy is Tagore asking us to think about? Okay, let me, let me try and answer that. Um, so the three things, the three ways in which we relate to the world, he says, are intellect, yeah. self-interest, and the final, which is his sort of, you know, uh, recommended path, uh, joy or anandu. Intellect is the most, for me, the most interesting critique he has actually of, of and, and he has that in the final essay as well, Shahitya Uti Hashikota, which uh, uh, Ranajit Guhu pulls up in uh, and discusses in uh, History at the Limits of World History, but I've, I've written about, about, uh, about that as well. He is again and again and again uh, against the pedantic, he absolutely cannot stand the 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 the, the scholarly or the the scholar who who is self-important with his own scholarship. He was fed up also with with people who were reading his work. This is the local Bengali sphere that I'm talking about, and 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 just because he got the Nobel Prize, I mean, of course, very celebrated and all of that, but. There were there was constantly this 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 as you know the Marxist materialist critics in Calcutta in the 1930s literally sort of said what are you doing what are you writing you don't know anything about you know the masses about the poor about the you know and and you're just sitting there in your ivory tower and you know writing about joy or whatever and you know that this is just not you know um, so so he faced that all through his life. Uh, he says at the end, when he is writing the introduction to his uh, uh, collected works, Robindra Rachanaboli, he says, I don't think there is another writer in history who has been 
so so much the focus of so much abuse as I have. I mean, through throughout my career. So so one of those one of the things that he attacks again and again is the self the, the aggrandizement of and the moral superiority of those with intellect, mm -hmm. by which he means the scholars and by which he means the pedantic scholars, mm -hmm. uh, scholars who will, who will, uh, who will uh, be full of themselves because uh, they think they know everything basically is his, is his, as a poet, as someone who's, who's, you know, he's, 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 um, so, so the intellect part is what is the part that I find the most interesting. The second is the more um, uh, immediately understandable part, self-interest, which is that, um, you know, the man of business, the man of, you know, self-interest, I mean, people do things selfishly, they do think, things for themselves, they do it for their own self-interest. That part is more imme immediately understandable. The third is his way. So he's saying, so there are these two ways, but then there is the third way, which is the way of Anundo. And, and, and this is something that he, you know, right from that, uh, that he picks up the phrase from, it's actually, there in the gate, uh, inscribed on the gate in Shantaniketan, if you go uh, in Bishwa, it is the motto of the uh, of the university, Bishwa Bharati, which takes that line from the Upanishads about 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 joy, uh, which um, Devendranath had found so much meaning in. But but he he goes back again and again to this concept of anundo, and as Indira said, of the superfluous, of of excess, of um, in order not, I think, to be constrained by anything at all, whether by the intellect, whether by, yeah, whether by, whether by, you know, uh, 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 utilitarian reasons, uh, to, to, to be given, uh, and, in, and again and again in his own poetry when he speaks of himself as a writer, when, in, when he's, because I've translated the letters he wrote uh, in Chinno Pachaboli when he's on his houseboat writing uh, uh, to his niece Indira Devi, this wonderful description, he, 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 he thinks of it, he actually describes himself as, you know, the, the words he valorizes are wild, savage, mad, you know, um, the baul is therefore uh, of, of such significance to, to him. So he, his whole, uh, whole ethics and his whole philosophy of life is predicated on, on this notion of, un, you know, he reduces it to that one word, an, anundo, but by it I think he basically uh, means very interestingly what, what Bath also is arguing for when Bath says that what we want the, uh, from literature, uh, or uh, and of course, Bath is uh, writing at the moment of the French uh, Nouveau Roman, uh, but but he's 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 basically defending what he calls the trembling of life. He says literature should be uh, about the trembling of life, not not uh, not uh, about long recitatives, not about narrative, not about. Uh, and he quotes um, Valerie, right? Uh, that line: the Marchioness went out at five o'clock. I mean, that's the line that all novels, all histories. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, will use to, to the, the the line that spells narrative with a capital N, and 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 it is the modernist project and the nouveau, you know, the the, the experimentalist, the avogad's project to shatter that that meta narrative and and to speak for the fragmentary for you know uh, 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 for for forms that actually um, turn away from that uh, from those enlightenment values. So a lot of what he says actually ties in very beautifully with. A lot of, so quite a lot of actually what also people like Adorno were saying, uh, uh, you know, um, in, in the 60s. So it's, it's very interesting. He's actually a very, very interesting uh, writer. He's, uh, uh, he's just a little difficult to wade through in because of the 19th century manner in which he writes and because he tends to sort of uh, waffle a bit. <laughs> well, we have been trained to, you know, I, I was educated in Calcutta. So right. Part of the yes, oh, absolutely, yeah. And that sort of dulls, uh, you know, your vision. You sort of, because it's so much in the air and so inculcated into you that you need to read it afresh to sort of get to who the man actually was behind the beard and behind the Robindra <laughs> Shungit. <laughs> Mm. And then you give the example of anthologies that, mm. you know, just collect together mm. things called world literature. And suddenly mm. you say, okay, mm. it's this and this and this and mm. this, right? Mm. But I'm wondering then, um, 
if that's not the way to go, mm. and it sounds like that's not the way to go, <laughs> then what uh, pedagogically, what do you think might be an alternative mm. way into world literature? Mm. My answer would be, and it's something that I've been thinking about since also since since I wrote the literary thing, because there, um, there too I've I've tried to find an answer to this. Uh, part of the answer might lie in the sort of thing that Jameson did in the modernist papers. Um, my answer would be to 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 actually look at the the one thing, you know. It could be punctuation. It could be it could be a line. It could be um, you know whatever it is that 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 means uh, the word a world to you or the world to you in in the sense that so that's why I began with Blake to see the world in a grain of sand because that's what I mean I I think I think perhaps although I'm not actually I'm not I don't I don't I lack the courage to actually make such a grandiose sort of you know um, tell people what they should be doing but I've been thinking about it because I, because of my own sort of dissatisfaction with the way in which sort of literature is done nowadays in literary departments and and everywhere like I, I I I sort of I think literature departments have stopped teaching literature in a sense I mean if I think back to why I studied literature in the first place I mean I studied literature to get away from sociology and history and <laughs> politics I mean I I went to literature because I wanted to read poetry or because I responded to a line of poetry or you know but but we 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 are not allowed anymore to respond to that line of poetry. It's not enough. It's it's not the you know it's a oh the new critics did that sort of thing. I mean you know how, but but without going back to doing what the new critics did, uh, which was to shut out the rest of the world and to think that that was the uh, the world. If it might be possible instead to turn in some inclusive way to a reading of particulars rather than an overarching uh, sort of you know reading that is to do with uh, to use the phrase i used in response to agendas or oh, might might work might not if it, whatever it is that, that that one does if it becomes an orthodoxy then immediately it's, and i think what's what's happening now is we've reached a point where th these these sort of um, categorizations to use the term have become an orthodoxy um, and 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 therefore this dissatisfaction and therefore this need to f to, to return to return to the text itself to return in some way to to something within yourself and in in the text or in 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 the world so the self and the other uh, imagery from from to go there I mean that's the best answer that I can sort of gesture at here yeah. just a very short uh, just thinking about the questions that came up mm. and it took me back to the first question about mm. you know uh, and your answer was about the literary critics and it seems to me that the reading of the particular <coughs> the idea of reading looking at the grain that's happening everywhere it's happening when individual readers are reading all kinds of things which are suddenly accessible to them mm. which were never accessible mm. before mm. In, in random ways mm. with no literary critic telling them this is how you read this or this is mm. what you should read mm. uh, i think a lot more of that is happening and it's also happening in classrooms mm. at least in the u.s mm. you know where curricula are being exploded in very uh, dramatic ways. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anyone's listening to the pundits who are telling you, you know, this is world literature. I, I think people aren't That's interested. very interesting to me because I am. This, this hmm. is the way I felt. I mean, hmm. I've, I've been doing world literature without ever hmm. paying attention to any of these people. Right. Yeah, that's very interesting to me because I don't know the U.S. Tomorrow. academic sort of system very well, but from a distance, the liberal, the liberal arts, college. the liberal arts colleges. But I, I've looked at I've looked at courses taught. Uh, you know, in literature departments, and I've seen. Not in English departments. Yes, I don't teach in English exactly. Departments. That's, the That's the key. If you take a look at what is actually taught in the literature departments, you'll see uh, it's very disappointing to see that it's almost entirely to do with what Rabindranath <coughs> is saying, don't do, which is uh, in terms of content. So, whatever happens to me, it could be ships or it could be, you know, it, at the moment when Gilroy wrote The Black Atlantic, suddenly the ship became, you know, the thing. Thing, the thing, the thing to do, or it could be water, rivers, or it could be, you know. But it's all content, and then, and then you choose those novels that are written about rivers, or those novels that have ships, or you know. And I don't know. Isn't that? How, I mean, it seems to me from a distance that that's how it's done. And. <laughs> 
Sorry. You know, so 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 how does one go back to to say Pound's translation of the Chinese poem uh, uh, without subscribing to the sort of either politics or <laughs> or sort of worldview that 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 the modernists of the, that Pound came to? So I think this is something that will need to be thought about. Yeah. Alger, you get the last question. So here I am. Um, trying to sort of grapple with your overall framework because at one level, and I'm completely with you, uh, I find from your description that Tagore has at least two moves that need to come together. Uh, one is the move of the world and the uh, world as this other. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to, to bring our perception to that zone where we can confront the other. Mm -hmm. okay? Self and, and other. the other yeah. is the coming together of the world in Sing, uh, whatever the author does hmm. with a joy, sense hmm. of joy. Hmm. I think those are two different moves. Hmm. And it seems that in one move, hmm. I'm coming slowly close to what you hmm. argued against in after, hmm. <laughs> which is again the interest not in mapping. And I mm -hmm. agree with you, mapping, hmm. I think it's sort of, hmm. a, and from Indira's comment, I'm thinking it's actually a paper tiger. Hmm. Like, hmm. And there might be a desire, mm. the enlightenment desire mm -hmm. to categorize mm. and so forth. But it seems that after was going against that to bring us into that zone mm. where the confronting of with the other leads to a certain thickness of text, sure. uh, a certain mistranslation mm. <coughs> and whatever the... And I think that Tobor would have liked that. Yes, anarchy. absolutely. Uh, and the other is that uh, on the <coughs> Coming together in this joyful fashion mm, mm. then seems to be energizing certain kind of ideas of authorship mm. that I think Bath will argue against. Mm -hmm. You would like it like an open sort of leavening and mm. arrangement, circulation mm. of. Mm. The later bath, maybe. But in writing degree zero, uh, uh, the early bath is actually not the, not yet the bath who is writing uh, 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 Death of the Author. Um, so what I'm, my mm. comment here is mm -hmm. like, you know, while you're talking about mm. American or Euro-American mm. sort of ways mm. of looking mm -hmm. and so forth, mm. it seems that these locations are important to your interpretation of Tagore mm -hmm. more than Bhagavad Gita in a way, which was signaled. And so I'm mm. thinking that we are actually in a sh the zone of circulation, mm -hmm. as Donald Cotter is saying, mm. and that actually, and with all its roughness and bumps mm. and mistranslations mm -hmm. and so forth, actually is what we are doing on the ground mm -hmm. and is a good thing. <laughs> sure. Yes. So, if I can quickly sort of answer answer your first, very first and very basic premise that Tagore is doing two things. So, one of the things is the self in relation to the other, which you're then linking linking to Apta, and the other is Anundo and the, you know the the, and 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 that you're saying that actually uh, um, uh, uh, is too authorial uh, f uh, for someone like Bath. So, so quickly in response in response to that, what I would say is um, that um, this notion of Anundo is very much premised on the notion of creativity for Togo. So, it's not so much the authorial or the author's emanation. It is to do with what is creation or what is creativity. Where, where does, where do the sort of, you know, springs of creativity well from? They well from the superfluous, that which has no use, which is anundo, just sheer joy, just, 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 you know, a blue sky. Anything, it could be, for, for Tagore, it could, it could be anything. But basically, He's not, and he really, despite being this, and, and any picture you look at of Tagore immediately sort of contradicts my, what I'm saying, because he just looks like this, you know, grand, grand old guy. But he's, he's actually in the writings itself, again and again and again, speaking against the authorial pres presence, never actually taking up that, that, uh, that, uh, that tone of voice or that argument at all. So that the, the premise of Anandu is in is one of creativity rather than one of uh, uh, you know the, the the author himself. That is in relation to creativity, and the self and the other 
is in yes you're right in in that he's he's exactly talking about um, the other and the self and the manner in which these two should be brought into circulation with each other yeah absolutely yeah thank you very very much Professor thank you thank you for having me